Thank you, Don. I'm very glad to see you all here today. I'm going to touch on five topics in 20 to 30 minutes to give you a bare bones overview of the book. And then I'll be happy to take questions and to sign copies that you'd like to have signed. The topics I'm going to address are what we're doing in undertaking our investigation, uh, what the NTSB had to say and why it's so completely implausible, what appears to be a more reasonable explanation of the cause of the crash that killed the senator, his wife, daughter, and five aides, and the reaction of the Wellstone family. But first, I'd like to begin by explaining that we are not the only individuals who have taken an interest in this case. In fact, almost immediately upon the occurrence of the crash on 25 October 2002, Michael Neiman, a professor at Buffalo State College, authored a piece raising the question whether Paul Wellstone might have been murdered given the intensity of the political opposition animosity really from the White House toward the senator whom they had targeted as their number one most wanted to remove from office opponent, politically speaking. Neiman surveyed a lot of the circumstances which include that control of the Senate was at stake, that Wellstone was the conscience of the Senate, that he had been the most persistent, outspoken, and articulate critic of the Bush administration across the board, and that, in fact, his death did contribute, together with the loss by Max Cleland in Georgia, a race that appears to have been determined by the use of electronic voting machines where there were many irregularities that indicated that that election was stolen. And if, in fact, you study the elections of uh, 2004, for example, and go back as far as 2000, you're going to find major electoral abnormalities, which are or ought to be of profound concern to every American, because if there's a detachment between the electoral process and governance, then the American people no longer have control over what happens to them as a nation by way of the politics of an administration, such especially as this one. So Michael Neiman raised the question about motivation, observing that it appeared to be profound, but that he had no evidence that, in fact, the senator had been assassinated. A second author who took a great interest in this case was Christopher Bolin of American Free Press. What Bolin observed was that the FBI was on the scene of the crash abnormally rapidly, that they were there, as it were, Johnny on the spot, that the St. Louis County Sheriff Rick Wahlberg had arrived at 1.30, had observed individuals he knew personally from the St. Paul Rapid Response Team who told him they had been there since noon. I spoke with Gary Ullman, the airport assistant manager, who actually was on duty the day of the crash, who hopped in his plane and actually had located the crash scene. And he told me while he'd been very busy handling phone calls, he knew they'd been there at least by 1 o'clock. Paul McCabe, interestingly a spokesman for the FBI, would later assert that the FBI had not shown up until 3.30. What's most interesting about what the sheriff has to tell us is that the crash didn't take place until about 10.20 and that Gary Ullman did not locate the crash until 11 a.m. So for the FBI to be there on the scene already by noon is indeed quite striking. A third person who's taken an interest in this case and written about it on more than one occasion is Michael Rupert, the celebrated investigative journalist of From the Wilderness. Rupert had writ has written, among other points, that he received a communication from someone on the inside who's been involved in wet work before, and that this was no accident. He told Rupert that a group of reinvigorated old white guys were running the show, that they were no one to screw around with, 
and you could bet that there would be other strategic accidents of this kind in the future. Rupert also reported that many members of Congress were profoundly troubled, especially by the timing, which was only 10 days before the election, that Paul Wellstone was polling ahead. He was six to seven points ahead at this point in time, and it appeared clear that he was going to defeat Norm Coleman, the hand-picked candidate of the White House, and undermine the reputation of this invincible political machine. Now, their reports, of course, are highly suggestive. They are not definitive. What I have done from the beginning, finding circumstances that appeared to me to be highly suspicious, is to attempt to undertake an analysis of the evidence that was becoming available in the case over a long period of time and subject it to analysis that we might know if and when the NTSB report became available, whether or not it bore a uh, reasonable relationship to the evidence and alternative hypotheses in this case. If you don't actually undertake some assessment of the evidence independent of a report, if you're solely dependent upon the report itself, it will be impossible for you to appraise its adequacy. This has been shown to be the case in the past with government reports, the most spectacular instance of which is the Warren Commission report on the death of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, which if you were to read that report on its own, seems very plausible. And that's, in fact, a virtue of the Warren report that is missing from the NTSB report, as I am going to explain. But the fact is, that you are at the mercy of the government and what it tells you if you don't have independent access and haven't thought about the relationship between the hypotheses and the evidence and how it should at least roughly fall out. Just to offer an illustration here, uh, following up on Boland's observation about the early arrival of the FBI, I consulted MapQuest and conducted a very simple reconstruction of the amount of time that it ought to have taken for the FBI to fly from St. Paul to Duluth to rent a car to drive to Eveleth, Virginia, and to arrive at the scene of the crash by noon. And it turned out that by using very conservative estimates, in other words, giving the FBI the break at every point along the line, such as how long it would take them to get to the airport, how long it would take them to take off, how long it would take them to rent a car, and so forth. I found that even using the most constrained estimates, they would have had to have left St. Paul at approximately 9.30 in the morning, which coincidentally is the same time that the senator's plane was taking off itself. Now, what this is... Uh, suggest to us is that the FBI has remarkable powers of anticipation to know that it should depart for the scene of a crash before the crash has even occurred. It meant, too, that the FBI was on the scene of the crash for some eight hours before any representative for the NTSB would even arrive. The FBI was keeping a very tight rein on the crash scene, even the AP photographer said he was given only 15 minutes to take photographs, which he recorded as highly unusual. One might have supposed that the more photographs, the better. Who knows what detail of the scene might be overlooked by someone, where if you had photographs, it could be extremely useful to reconstruct what happened. But that was not the attitude of the FBI. That evening, already, there would be announcement from the FBI that they had found no signs of terrorist involvement. This would be repeated the next day by the head of the NTSB investigative team, Carol Carmody, which was quite striking given that it was the responsibility of the NTSB to determine the cause of the crash and not that of the FBI. Particularly surprising since the plane underwent an unusual fire that burnt for over five hours with such intensity that the firemen were unable to even extract the, body, the bodies from the plane, which would later have to be identified on the basis of their dental records. <laughs>
So I say with a plane reduced to charcoal, how could the FBI possibly know that there had been no terrorist involvement? Stop and consider. To even draw such an inference, you would at the very least have to know the cause of the crash. The cause of the crash would not be ascertained by the NTSB for more than a year. And yet here on the very day of the crash, the FBI was assuring the country that there was no sign of terrorist involvement. And since, of course, this was an NTSB responsibility, it's all the more remarkable that Carol Carmody was simply echoing their report. And since there was no knowledge of the cause of the crash, how could you know that it had not been brought about by a small bomb, a gas canister, or some high-tech weapon of which the country is largely unaware? All those things are possible. Most ironically, it turns out there actually was a terrorist connection to this crash because the co-pilot, Michael Guess, had had a contact with Zacharias Massawi, who has been alleged by the government to be the 20th hijacker involving providing Massawi with software regarding instructions for flying a Boeing 747. So I say, stop and think about it. What was the FBI doing here? How could their report have possibly been justified? How could they possibly have known? Why was there an exchange of roles between the NTSB and the FBI? Interestingly, when the NTSB report would finally appear, it does not even acknowledge that the FBI were ever there. It does not even acknowledge that the FBI were ever there. According to the NTSB report, these pilots caused the crash by failing to keep track of their airspeed and altitude and simply allowed the plane to crash. Now I must tell you, it's not rocket science to realize that the most elementary information pilots are taught to keep track of when they fly is their airspeed and altitude. Moreover, the NTSB suggests that the pilots were really not well qualified, and yet Richard Conry, who was the principal pilot, had 5,200 hours of experience. He was qualified as an air transport pilot, which happens to be the highest possible qualification. And interestingly, he had passed his FAA flight check. He'd had a government inspector with him piloting a plane two days before the fatal crash. To suggest this man is not qualified to fly this plane is to suggest no pilot is qualified to fly any plane because he was surely as qualified as anyone has ever been to fly this King Air A100, which happens to be something like the Rolls-Royce of small aircraft. The NTSB in early reports did talk about the weather, but even the NTSB itself would admit that the weather had not been at fault. Indeed, it had been early reports about the weather that I consider to be grossly exaggerated, that were making it out not only on local, but on state and even national television, talking about snowstorms and ice storms and icing on the wings, which was extraordinarily implausible if you actually lived in northern Minnesota and were paying to att attention to the weather at the time. There was a major storm that day, but it was in southern Minnesota. It may have affected Minneapolis, in St. Paul, but it was nowhere near Eveleth, Virginia, which of course is well to the north of Duluth. So these reports about the weather I thought were extremely disturbing. It appeared to me like reports about three shots fired by a lone assassin, that this was a cover story that was being planted and promulgated to reassure the American people that nothing untoward had been going on. But I ask you just to consider What's the probability that you have two pilots, both of whom are well qualified, neglect their airspeed and altitude on a relatively routine landing in a very high quality uh, aircraft when the weather was just not that bad? In fact, other planes had landed at Eveleth, Virginia that morning, and I've already mentioned that when he realized the plane was overdue, Gary Ullman had hopped in his own aircraft and taken off and flown around in an effort to try to find the plane. 
There was no hesitation in his doing so. The weather was not at fault, neither was the plane. The pilots, therefore, were left to hold the bag. And, and yet, even the NTSB's own investigation undermined that hypothesis. For example, they took pilots with similar background and training from Charter Aviation, which had arranged for this flight for Paul Wellstone, down to Florida, where they had a simulator that, interestingly, had a weaker engine than the King Air A100. And they program a similar flight plan and weather conditions and had the pilots fly at abnormally slow speeds and they couldn't bring it down. They couldn't bring it down. <coughs> Local experts learning of this were quoted in the Pioneer Press as observing that plane should still have been in the air. What I'm telling you is the NTSB's own investigation contradicted the NTSB's conclusion. In fact, one member of the board who signed the report, a fellow by the name of Richard Healy, said actually they had no idea what had caused this crash, that they were merely speculating. Well, I believe we can do better, but in a case like this, you may have to look for small signs that can be very telling small signs that can be very telling. One, and this also undermines the NTSB report, is that this plane was equipped with a sophisticated stall warning device. In fact, the device was so sophisticated that other pilots in the simulator, when they heard it, were able to power up. They never had a problem. So if these two pilots, one of whom was extremely well qualified, the other clearly qualified, had in fact somehow improbably neglected their airspeed and altitude, are we to further surmise that they did not respond to a stall warning device that would have given them ample opportunity to pull out of a potential crash scenario? Not very likely. Surely, surely, the probability that they were unable to pull out of the crash because the plane was no longer under their control is far more plausible than the idea that the plane was under their control. They simply lost track of their airspeed altitude and neglected the stall warning device. Plus, another striking feature of the crash is that there was no distress call. No distress call was made. Now, if you're in northern Minnesota, if you're going down in a rather swampy wooded area, you have a United States senator and, and uh, seven others aboard the aircraft, surely you would realize it would be extraordinarily important to let people know you are going down. The life of the parties here could very well depend upon how rapidly rescue teams were able to reach the area. And that no call, no distress call was made. This is particularly striking given that there was regular communication with the tower, including the radar surveillance, in Duluth prior to the last few minutes of the flight. Those communications incidentally have been identified as coming from Michael Guest, the co-pilot, which is perfectly what you would expect if the pilot, Richard Connery, were in charge of the plane and the co-pilot were handling the communications. So why was there no distress call? Why did they not respond to a stall warning device? Why, interestingly, did a local resident of Duluth who represents the city in negotiations with the state legislature, a very responsible fellow by the name of John Ongaro, experienced a very peculiar cell phone anomaly when he was in the vicinity of the airport at the approximate time the crash would take place. He wrote to me when he discovered that I was investigating this case to say how he had this very odd cell phone call that it involved wailing and garbled noises, but there was a certain periodicity or regularity to the sounds, but it was unlike anything he had ever experienced. Could it be related? I suggested to Paul that he check his records, and he discovered the cell phone call had been made at 10.18. The plane had been due at 10.20. We believe something happened at approximately 10.18, that not only disabled the stall warning device, took control of the aircraft away from the pilots,
and also caused Paul Ongaro's anomalous cell phone problem. What we speculate is that this was an electromagnetic weapon of one or another type that this country has been developing, but of which the American people are largely unaware. They come in many varieties. There are radio frequency weapons. There are electromagnetic pulse weapons. There are uh, high energy radio frequency weapons, some of which can be bought for as little as $150 if you go on to the internet. These weapons focus electromagnetic energy. They can do it in an area or in a relatively pointed manner, analogous to that of a laser. They have the effect, the similar effects to being exposed to a microwave oven. Okay? This is not a good thing for, for human beings or other living things. But let me point out, the immediate effects of an electromagnetic pulse weapon would be to take out all the electronic systems on the plane, including the stall warning device. It would disable the navigational aids. If it were strong enough, it would overwhelm the electrical circuits and cause a fire. The most striking feature of, of uh, <coughs> the attempt to locate the plane when Gary Ullman flew around was he saw whitish blue smoke coming up from a distance, but he was very confident that would not be the plane because aircraft fuel burns coarsely black. So he didn't even go to investigate the whitish blue smoke. It turns out initially, but it turns out that was indeed the location of the crash. Whitish blue smoke is what occurs from the result of an electrical fire. I have consulted with chemists who have assured me that jet fuel would not burn, this kerosene-based fuel for the plane would not burn hot enough to ignite the fuselage. And yet the fuselage burned with such intensity the, the fire department was unable to extract the bodies and perplexed that they could not put the fire out. They could not put the fire out. There are other supporting considerations here, which include that several residents in the area reported that day their garage doors were found open, even though they hadn't caused that to happen. We believe that was a spillover effect of the use of an electromagnetic pulse weapon. If you go on to Google and do a search, you'll find a lieutenant general of the Air Force was giving a report to Congress about these weapons as early as 1996. If you check local, local recent reports coming out of Congress, uh, John Kyle, senator from Arizona, very conservative fellow, not inclined to conspiracy theories, is reported to the Senate that the greatest threat the United States faces from a potential enemy, a rogue state, or uh, some terrorist power would be to expose the United States to an electromagnetic attack that would disable all the computerized, computerized systems across the country. He has observed that this is the single greatest threat to American security that exists in the world today. And I would suggest to you, and there's ample evidence to support this, that a kind of power that could paralyze the nation has the capacity to bring down a single aircraft. So what we do here is to lay out the evidence about motive, means, and opportunity. We also observe that the NTSB has a very peculiar legal status under the law. For example, a crash scene cannot be investigated as the scene of a crime unless the Attorney General declares it to be a crime scene. Plus, number two, NTSB reports are not admissible as evidence in courts of law. So I would suggest to you that here we have a foolproof technique or method for eliminating our political opponents. We are in charge of the administration provided we have a complicit or compliant attorney general. All that needs to be done to preclude any criminal investigation is for him to decline to declare it to be the scene of a crime, and no criminal investigation takes place. Such that when we studied the NTSB report 
we discovered that the only hypotheses, the only alternative explanations that were considered given any attention whatsoever by the NTSB were accident alternatives involving the plane, the pilots, or the weather. No consideration was given to the possibility it might have been a small bomb or a gas canister, much less a sophisticated weapon of the kind that we believe, in fact, was employed in this case. And I can assure you that if anyone set out to investigate this case and only considered the possibility the plane, the pilots, or the weather were at fault, undoubtedly they would be led to incline toward blaming the pilots. That's perfectly responsible in the sense that if those are the only three alternatives, it certainly wasn't the weather, and the NTSB conceded as well that it was not the plane. But notice the flaw in the methodology. I mean, it may be in part because professionally, I am a professor of logic, critical thinking, and scientific reasoning, that it was so striking to me that they were violating basic aspects of scientific procedure in their investigation by failing to consider the full range of possible alternative explanations. What you will find in the book, therefore, is the evidence fleshed out over the skeleton I've just given you that I hope you will find, as others have found, who have actually read our book, to find very compelling, persuasive. And I can stand here and assure you that the pattern of reasoning that we have employed throughout this book is the most defensible technique, principles of scientific reasoning, available to the human mind, a pattern known as inference to the best explanation which requires that we take into account all the possible alternative explanations and weigh the impact of those explanations in relation to the available evidence in order to ascertain which among the hypotheses, if true, would confirm the highest probability on the evidence, which yields a measure of likelihood or of evidential support, where once the evidence is settled down, you're entitled to accept although provisionally and tentatively in the manner of science. That hypothesis as true as providing the best explanation. I can assure you, when you contrast the accident hypothesis with the assassination hypothesis, the accident hypothesis has an approximately zero probability on the evidence, whereas the assassination hypothesis has a high probability on the evidence. In my judgment, there's simply no comparison, but I invite you to read and study the evidence for yourself. Let me just add, we continue our research. We are gathering more evidence. We have nothing, we have found nothing that, that does not strengthen our position. And with subsequent printings of this book or through other venues, we intend to make the additional evidence that we are discovering available to the American people. Let me add that my colleague as an author in this work is a Native American scholar by the name of Don Four Arrows Jacobs from Northern Arizona University. But that in addition, I've had the benefit of a, an Australian physicist by the name of John Costella, who has a PhD in electromagnetism and who authored a section of this book for us on past history of electromagnetic effects in relation to aircraft. Let me just remind you, in case you may have, it may have lapsed your memory, the last time you were on a plane, do you remember that they suggested that you turn off your cell phone, not use your laptop computer, because it might interfere with aircraft communication? Well, if major airways are that concerned about commercial aircraft possibly having problems, with uh, the minor amount of electromagnetic interference that would be generated by, by cell phones and laptops and Game Boys, what do you think is the potential for a weapon that's purposefully constructed in order to subject planes to a high, intense degree of electromagnetism? The effects are <coughs> tremendous, and they even extend beyond taking out the electromagnet, the, the computerized components, the electronics of the plane, also, and the electricity, but even to, they have the potential for rendering humans unconscious, incapable of voluntary muscle control, or even dead. 
So what I'm suggesting to you is there is every reason to take this all uh, hypothesis seriously and that uh, we have systematically laid out the evidence for all of the possible alternatives in the book. That brings me finally to the family. A lawsuit was brought in the name of the family against the Charter Aviation. The lawsuit claimed that Charter Aviation had been negligent by allowing these pilots to pilot that plane. Ironically, Richard Conroy had flown Paul Wellstone many times. Paul Wellstone preferred to fly with Richard Conroy. Anyone who looks into Conroy's background and qualifications has to judge us to be highly implausible. Nevertheless, the Wellstone family settled for millions of dollars on the basis of the contention that Charter Aviation had been negligent. I'm profoundly disturbed that the Wellstone family is unwilling to consider the possibility that Paul Wellstone was deliberately taken out as a political assassination. The motivation was overwhelming. I guarantee you Paul Wellstone would have supported our investigation because Paul Wellstone believed in the truth and he believed the looking the truth square in the eye and he could look this administration square in the eye and explain that it was corrupt and dishonest and deceiving the American people. I was supposed to do a book signing yesterday at the bookstore of the Americas. The person responsible for this contacted me last week and told me regrettably it had been canceled because members representing the Wellstone family did not want it to take place. And I say to you, this is a disgusting betrayal of the legacy of Paul Wellstone. And it should have come from people in the name of people who claim to be representing him is a disgrace. And I want the world to know that this is taking place. It is wrong. It is immoral. It is corrupt. We know quite a lot about this case. I'd be happy to take questions, yes. Would that weapon have had to be on the plane? No. Oh, no, no, no. This would be a ground to air. It can come in a backpack. It could look like as big as a duffel bag. It could look like a set of golf clubs. You can find these things. It was probably, and I won't go into why I believe this, but it was probably brought in a van and by a small team. My opinion is that the most likely persons responsible for making this decision is the triumvirate that actually run the White House, Carl Rove, Dick Cheney, and Donald Rumsfeld. Those are the persons I believe were ultimately responsible for the death of Paul Wellstone. Unlike the death of JFK, however, very few people need to have known about this. I'm willing to speculate as few as 10 or 12 people even knew. The people at the top, a few intermediaries in the Department of Defense, and the people at the bottom who actually carried this out. Let me make an interesting observation that some may find more than coincidental. Uh, the King Air A100 is a Beechcraft product. Beechcraft is owned by Raytheon. Raytheon is one of our nation's largest military industrial contractors. Raytheon manufactures weapons of the very kind that I believe were involved in taking out Paul Wellstone. It's impossible that the kind of information that would have been necessary to know how best to take out this plane was not available to the Department of Defense. Can you talk to the the publisher has made repeated efforts to reach Mark Wellstone specifically, and he has been oddly unavailable. I can't tell you precisely what's going on here in the mind of Mark Wellstone. I can simply tell you that Paul Wellstone would have wanted this to be pursued to the bitter end. I'll also tell you that about 10 days before his death, Paul Wellstone reported having been threatened by Vice President Cheney, who told him that if they opposed him on Iraq, that the most severe ramifications would occur for him personally and for the state of Minnesota. I cannot consider or contemplate a more severe ramification than the death of this fine man. Yes. I heard that um, Kennedy was supposed to be on that plane too. Do you yeah. think they were looking to take him out as well? Right. Or do you think that was part of it, or do you think it was specifically Wellstone? 
my inclination is to believe that that was coincidental, that taking Teddy out would not have been part of the plan, but taking Wellstone out when they had the ideal opportunity. I mean, remember that the principal elements for investigating a crime are motive, means, and opportunity. I think that the, the death of Benny Rukavina, the funeral being held there, was just the ideal setup because it's a very sparsely populated area. There are lots of trees and wooded. It could be very difficult to get to the crash scene. If you can get the FBI there on the scene, you can keep those who might, you know, the nosy civilians, even the fire department or whatever, AP photographers out of the scene. If there's something you need to extract to conceal what was going on, you do it. And let me just say, this would hardly be the first time that the FBI or the NTSB has been used to cover up crime scenes. The FBI used a three-stage filter in the case of JFK. If a witness was too close to the limousine, they never called them. The 10 closest witnesses to the limousine were never called. If they were called and had important information, you didn't ask them questions that would extract the important information. Or if somehow you slipped up and you actually allowed that important information to come forth, then you distorted the record. This happened time and time again. Yes? I was wondering, you know, with the, the papers initially reported, um, the Icing, icing on the wings and weather problems, and then after that it became um, uh, negligence or lack of training or whatever with the pilots. But but your report is really different. And so what I was wondering was, I mean, the, like the Tribune is saying that that uh, he had all the uh, Connery had all these had falsified hours. And so it, how how is it that the it seems like the the public record is that he wasn't that good that good of a pilot he lied about his his past and and where well, you you're saying you gotta, that it sounds you gotta, like he was a, you gotta separate the apples from the oranges somebody bounces a bad check does that mean that they're not qualified to teach yeah, accounting yeah. if they're a professor of accounting they bounce a bad check a a any pilot is going to have occasions where things aren't exactly right what the NTSB did was take some of these occasions and try to magnify them. For example, it said on one occasion, Connery had lost track of the controls and was the plane was falling at a rate of a thousand feet per, per per minute. Well, how how long do you think that lasted? A couple of seconds. This is like my when I'm driving on the highway and my wife observes I'm starting to veer to the left, right? Well, of course, if I continued veering to the left, I'd wind up in the other lane and cause a head-on collision, which would be catastrophic. But she corrects me, and I continue driving, and this is perfectly routine. And do you think that ought to appear on my record that, you know, on this occasion, Jim Fetzer, for a couple of seconds, <laughs> let his car veer to the left? That's what they did with Connery. And something else. Okay, Connery had double books, apparently, on his flight records. Okay. He had double books mean? on the flight records. What does that say about his qualifications to fly this aircraft? Okay. I'm not saying the guy was a saint. I'm not saying he wasn't a, he was a, an infallible human being. But I'm saying he was highly qualified to pilot this aircraft by the government's own standards. He had 5,200 hours of experience. He had an air transport pilot's qualification, the highest possible. And damn it all, he had passed his FAA flight check two days before the fatal flight. In the judgment of the government, he was qualified to fly that plane, as qualified as anyone who's ever flown that plane. I tell you now. There was so much rubbish coming out about the weather, it was ubiquitous. <laughs> this bothered me from scratch. This immediately got my attention. I have seen enough of cover-ups and the ways they can be done in the past in my study of JFK and other deaths that it was obvious to me something was wrong here. Even had Wolf Blitzer on CNN saying, oh, the weather was just terrible and all and all, and they didn't even land at the airport. And Wolf says, oh, yeah, and that obviously tells you what's going on here, implying they didn't land at the airport because the weather was so bad. Well, if there's a crash, you don't land at the airport because you don't know what caused the crash. And maybe there's something featured at the airport that is going to cause another crash or that you need to leave in place the way it was so you can find out. what it's a, it's a scene of an accident. You have to leave it the way it was to find out what happened. So here was Wolf Blitzer, of all people, giving a very exaggerated, distorted, misleading report. They didn't even identify that two other persons who were in the plane were pilots. Because as soon as you knew there were two pilots and the plane only actually required one, mm -hmm. the probability of pilot error is, is reduced by a multiple. It's a prob you know, the improbability just shrinks. Mm -hmm. So I assure you, we go through all this so patiently. You're not going to believe how many weather reports we have in the first chapter. You're not going to believe how much we tell you about the motivation of the Bush administration. You're not going to believe how patiently we've gone through the NTS report and dismantled it piece by piece. And I have done yet another study. 
with John Costella going through the NTSB report all over again. We have an even more thorough and more devastating critique of the government's failure to do justice to Paul Wellstone and explain the cause of this crash. Yes. Uh, I think you said something about that plane burned for so long. <coughs> about five what, hours. What would cause that? That seems unusually long, though. I agree with you. It is unusually long. In fact, it's the most striking feature of the crash. So what you find about it in the entire NTSB report, which runs oh, 80 pages or more with the supporting documents, there was a post-impact fire. That's what they say. There was a post-impact fire. They don't say anything about the cause of the fire. I mean, it's presumably, of course, you, you know, they leave you. This is a very clever tactic of the government, okay? They, they make some assumptions that are predicated on your continuing to believe things you've believed in the past and don't point out that there may be an anomaly here. They don't say anything about the oddity of the fire. They don't say anything about how long it burned. They don't say anything about the massive destruction to the fuselage you know, and, and, and thereby of evidence and that the bodies were charred and could only be identified on the basis of demo records. This is the single most striking feature of the crash and it is basically completely ignored by the NTSB. Now I say, that cannot be by accident. They have very clever people who write these reports. And if you only read the report, it's still going to be plausible, and you're not going to realize that the most salient feature of the crash is not even studied by the NTSB, just as they don't even mention that the <laughs> FBI was present from the beginning. Yes? Can you say a little bit about how, first of all, what would cause the fire to burn for so long and so hot? Is it that it's metal burning, or what sort of thing. Yeah, it's got to do with metal burning, but based on my experience in the Marine Corps, I mean, I was really troubled because it reminded me of white phosphorus. White phosphorus is such a da dangerous substance that once it begins burning, you can't possibly put it out. You can't put it out with water. That's just what the firemen said. They said they couldn't put the plane out with, they couldn't put the fire out with water. So they were baffled. They didn't know what they were up against. But it was burning metal, and it was an electrically based fire. We know that from the yellowish blue smoke. And, of course, you put it all together, and what you've got is the electronics and the electrical system was taken out, which accounts for the cessation of communication, no warning, the failure, the, the loss of control of the aircraft, John Ongaro's anomalous cell phone, even these folks who found the garage door open. I mean, I, I think we have it. Now, whether we have everything that we will ever have about it, I don't think that's the case. We're picking up more. We're putting more together. We've done a more thorough and more devastating critique of the NTSB report. But I think that in general, what we have here is going to hold up. Yes. Let's um, use weapons. Is there any documentation anywhere as uh, the, the use in the past uh, of these weapons anywhere? Well, there's, they're designed for this purpose. There's a whole. Uh, the, the, the Air Force has a whole uh, training ground. I give you lots of links, but you can just go on there. Just put in. Just put in herf guns or put in uh, EMP for electromagnetic pulse or put in RF weapon and you're going to get just deluge with tons of reports. I mean, I must have run across 50, 60, maybe 100 and, you know, in at some point in time we can lay it out more elaborately, but the fact of the matter is, as John Costello reports in the section he wrote about e e these electromagnetic problems, planes were flying out, falling out of the sky because the, of the failure to appreciate that the microwave relay towers, for example, were putting this stuff out. So, I mean, th th this has been a problem for a long time, even accidental. And, and, and the probabilities that the government has given us for these, these problems occurring are based on more recently designed aircraft that have special ways of coping with their present that was not true in the past. And most of the planes that are still flying are planes of which it's not true. So they give you false statistics so the American people aren't going to be worried that their plane is going to come down because they flew too close to some microwave relay tower. I tell you, I got people who are competent in this stuff, right? I know my own limitations. I'm not a, uh, an electrical engineer. I'm not an electronic specialist. But by God, John Costello has a PhD in electromagnetism. And I got him involved at just the right time, just as he's done brilliant work. So you have to realize that in order to involve the Secret Service in setting the man up for the hit, this had to be very high level involvement by the government. And you have that at Lyndon Johnson and J. Edgar. Yeah. You have uh, electronic voting machines and above it's electronic and electromagnetic waves. Is there a connection that you, what, you, what are you saying about the electronic? No, no, no. You, you remember when I started out, I was talking I was about, oh, 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 okay. Well, one of the points I made was in terms of political motivation, the control of the Senate was at stake. 
and the, the loss of the loss of two seats gave control to the Republicans. And one of those seats was Max Cleland in Georgia, where, where voting the, the election was stolen using electronic voting machines. The stories there about Bush brothers we put into the book because they're so striking and because they challenge analyzing motive, means, and opportunity. I mean, look, there's a lot in this book is to place this event in something like a broader framework. As uh, Jim has pointed out, the day after the Wellstone assassination, 69% of Minnesotans felt that the foul play was involved and that the Republican Party was behind it. Uh, you know, after all the propaganda in the media, uh, you know, that, that number went down over time. But the evidence is, uh, uh, is pretty darn convincing. Uh, but the second thing I'd, I'd like to ask Jim is, um, if we are to bring the guilty uh, parties uh, to justice uh, with this assassination, um, would it involve, do you think, uh, basically the first thing would be uh, after we build up the critical mass and public understanding of this, would it be a grand jury in, uh, in the, the county uh, where Eveleth is located, or would it be a, the state uh, attorney general who would uh, call a state grand jury, or what would, what would you see, uh, and if we were able to get uh, a grand jury where people had to testify under oath, uh, you think it would result in uh, uh, indictments or further investigation? Well, one thing I think is quite clear, namely that any federal investigation would lead nowhere. The federal investigation of uh, the death of JFK produced the Warren Report. The federal investigation of 9-11 produced the 9-11 Commission Report, and they are very much on a par they are uh, whitewashed, they involve selective use of evidence. I don't have the opportunity to share more with you about 9-11. I will say two or three things, however. Uh, there are a couple of books by an esteemed theologian from Claremont by the name of David Ray Griffin. First book is called The New Pearl Harbor. The second book is called The 9-11 Commission Omissions and Distortions. David Ray Griffin, to the best of my knowledge, is the sole critic of the government in relation to 9-11 who has received any degree of major press coverage. He was on C-SPAN 2 a couple of weeks ago during their book section discussion. A lecture he gave at the University of Wisconsin-Madison a couple of weeks before. And while that was broadcast here early in the morning on Saturday, Within two weeks, C-SPAN 2 rebroadcast that at 2.30 in the afternoon, which had to be the result of a tremendous surge of interest in what Griffin had to say. And you read David Ray Griffin, or go online and, and put in his name, David Ray Griffin, and you're going to find where you can get access over the Internet to the talk he gave in, in Madison a few weeks ago. And if, if, you know, I'm telling you, if anyone hasn't thought seriously about 9-11, it's a very good idea that you start thinking seriously about 9-11. They believe if they tell a big lie and tell it awful enough, often enough that most Americans are going to believe it. I'm sorry to say this turns out to be true. You've got to take some time and effort and figure out what's going on. Uh, an awful lot of us are too comfortable with our television and our six-pack and our football games and our movies to pay attention to what's happening to the United States of America. I'm telling you here, this, this Wellstone incident was one in a pattern. The pattern is what is important. The pattern is creeping, encroaching fascism, American style. Let me just conclude with one observation for those who may think that's an exaggeration. Mussolini, who knew something about it, said that fascism could equally be, well be defined as corporatism because corporatism is a merger of big government with big business. Fascism is typified by the identification of the leader with the state so that any criticism of the leader is regarded as unpatriotic or even treasonous. It's also typified by rampant militarism, including military aggression and nationalism. And I thank you.